So as I recall, it's only ever mentioned once in the entire show. Do you remember what exactly is Chandler Bing's job? Oh, he's a transponster. In the Friends Cinematic Universe, the character of Chandler Bing is known primarily for two things. Being sarcastic as all hell and having a job so boring and dull, nobody in the show actually knows what it is he does for a living. As it turns out, this job actually pays so much money it allows Chandler to function as his roommate's sugar daddy for three years straight. So this roommate, Joey, right? Yeah, of course it's Joey, yeah, who throughout the show's run is consistently, bar for like the last season or so where he starts to have a little bit of success, portrays a struggling actor with like less career prospects than like a member of Game of Thrones who isn't Peter Dinklage. I'm just going to put it out there, no one on that fucking show is going to have any success beyond the next five years. You can mark my words on that bastard. Because they've tried, haven't they? So we've talked about this in private before, but fuck it, we can talk about it now. So, and I should clarify what I mean by that statement. I don't mean any of the actors who were already established and famous before Game of Thrones, because they were hired for that exact reason. I mean the people who were introduced because of Game of Thrones. Because how many of those like new actors who were introduced in that show have tried to go on to other things or have been hired because they were hot in Hollywood at that point? And that thing has just failed completely. And I don't forget about Pompeii. Pompeii with Kit Harrington, you know, that cinematic turd that squeaked out into cinemas and made like less of a splash than an actual fucking turd. Or Terminator Genesis with Amelia Clark. Or Solo, a smuggler's tale with Amelia Clark. Or the most recent like X-Men movies with Sophie Turner, an actor. Fun fact, admitted that she got the role over a better actor. <laughs> Have you ever heard this story? I haven't. Sophie Turner, so she plays a Jean Grey in like, you know, like the new reboot of like, you know, X-Men that's gonna like fucking get erased from existence as soon as Disney gets it. Um, she was like going up against like two other actors for the role, and no one's quite sure who exactly it was, but a rumour is it's like I'm gonna mispronounce this name. I think it's, it's the actress she played Hannah in the film Hannah, and it's Soiree. Ron Ronson, something like that. You can put the name below, it's that. It's really hard to explain. But that actress is one rumoured to have been in the running for the role alongside Sophie Turner. And there's an interview where Turner goes, oh yeah, it was me and another actress. And the other actress was way fucking better than I am. Oh God, she blew me out of the water in the audition. So, so how did you get the role? She goes, oh, because I had more followers on Instagram. Wow. Yeah. So I have a lot of faith in that movie, Dark Phoenix, coming out this year. Because nothing says a studio has faith in its products doing well at the box office, like hiring an actress purely for her social media following and not her acting ability. <laughs> How bad does that sound? Like they had a better actress for the role, but they hired me because they can get me to like put fucking hashtag X-Men on fucking Instagram. So, so what you're saying there is the studio has, like doesn't give a fuck about the quality of the product, just about getting it out there. So, like, oh yeah, don't don't worry, but don't worry about like you know behind the scene. Just consume product and get excited for next product. It's fucking hell. When you need to bring in Sansa Stark's Instagram followers for X Men. <laughs> <laughs> X-Men! It's so bad. The idea that the studio said, oh, and they told her, and she wasn't bothered by it. She wasn't bothered by it. No, no, like, you're a worse. Like, there was a better actress who came in, but you're getting into your Instagram followers. And I think she says, oh, yeah, it's like, that's the way Hollywood is. Well, it's not. Like, because there are plenty of, like, you know, movies out there where they hire actors who are good actors. <laughs> it's just like, that's the way Hollywood is when they're making shit movies no one gives a fuck about. <laughs> Oh, man, because that, that to me just says, like, we have no faith in this movie succeeding because we're basing, like, you know, we're hinging its success purely on the fact it stars that girl from Game of Thrones. <laughs> the same, like, Terminator Genesis, isn't it? It's, oh, it's got Amelia Clark. And we've talked, again, we've talked before, but you have to put it in, Brad. You have to put in the first promo image of Terminator Genesis because people don't believe how bad it was. So you're going to put it behind me. It's Amelia Clark firing a machine gun at the ground. Like, she's just screaming and firing a machine gun at the ground. It's like, and this is supposed to, this is, this is Sarah Connor, the character who in, like, Terminator 2 is doing endless, like, pull-ups and has, like, the arms. And he's, like, so well prepared for, like, the future, like, end of the world that she has a coffin full of guns buried in New Mexico or some shit. And the, we're supposed to believe that that character, as a younger person, fired machine guns at the floor while screaming. <laughs> So before we move on, because we're talking about Game of Thrones actors, like, have you ever heard like one of the roles that made Peter Dinklage famous, obviously before Game of Thrones? No. It was a, a movie that he stars in alongside Gary Oldman called Tiptoes, which is about a dwarf. And guess what role Peter Dinklage plays? The, the dwarf? No, no, he plays like, you know, a side character. The dwarf is played by Gary Oldman, who walks around on his knees. <laughs> I'm not making this up. 
Like, Wait, so they, they had Peter Dinklage, Peter Dinklage on their film? Yeah, and they and they got Gary Oldman, who is a fantastic actor, but, and obviously he's chameleonic in his, like, you know, his ability to portray the character. But I don't think he can shrink three foot. And throughout the movie, it's very clear that he's just walking around on his knees, his shoes on. How fucking annoyed would you be if you were Peter Dinklage? Apparently Peter Dinklage isn't mad at the movie, because he says it was, like, you know, quite a good movie, but he got butchered in editing. Yeah. So he was, like, you know, quite, like, a a good portrayal of people like, you know, with this condition, but they butchered it in editing. But it's more the fact that they had Peter Dinklage right there. Like, future double Emmy Award winning actor Peter Dinklage. But then again, they also had Gary fucking Oldman, but it's the idea that they made Gary Oldman walk around on his fucking knees. <laughs> and that's what you can see it because it's like his body's so out of proportion. He's got really long arms. It looks like ET or some shit. It's so offensive. But I mean, I assume that Peter Dinklage wasn't the only dwarf on set. So imagine if there was just they were all just you just Gary Oldman's there on his knees. Yeah, like, you, you're I, so insulting. It's just Peter Dinklage is like, is this really what people think of me? <laughs> it's just so bad. Do you really have that little faith in uh, anyone else as an actor that you would have to? You like yeah. obviously Gary Oldman is a fantastic that's actor. That's what I mean. But, that's why. But, but just. I know it's a different role. <laughs> it's good. Gary Oldman's a fantastic actor, but he can't shrink three foot. I think even Daniel Day Lewis would like shy away from that. And was like, you know what? Even I'm not like committed to method acting. <laughs> it's like the, Gary Oldman is like in every scene. Like when you see him from like so he's zoomed out, he's so obviously on his fucking knees with like shoes, like you do when you're a kid. And that's the limit of the special effects budget. It's like fucking hell. So to bring this back to Friends, how much money does Joey owe Chandler? We never actually find out in any episode of the show, but it's hinted at multiple times that it's quite substantial. And the closest we ever get to like, direct confirmation is immediately after Joey appears in a movie, oddly enough alongside Gary fucking Oldman, playing like some apparently famous actor in the Friends cinematic universe. And he invites Chandler to the premiere, Chandler falls asleep, Joey gets annoyed, says I'm going to pay you back for all the money that I owe you. And what he does is they sit down with a piece of paper and Chandler lists through all the things that he paid for over the years, like a couple of years of rent, acting lessons, headshots, that sort of thing. And what Joey does then is he takes all that information, calculates roughly how much he owes Chandler for all those years he was helping him out, takes one look at the figure and decides to immediately forgive him and move past the whole thing. And as you watch that scene back, one thing you should keep in mind is that Joey just had a starring role in a major motion picture. So it's not like he's exactly hurting for money at that moment. So the amount on that piece of paper must be pretty fucking big. Also, as well, Chandler doesn't seem that bothered that Joey isn't going to pay him that money back, like, ever. No, and that's the weirdest thing about it, obviously. It's very clearly a substantial amount of money. Like, enough where an, a guy who's just appeared in a, like, a, a motion picture as, like, one, in one of starring roles doesn't have enough money on hand to pay it back without bankrupting themselves. And he's like, oh, no, it's fine. Don't worry about it. And that's not the only time in the series where, ca like, Chandler casually just throws away, like, what amounts um, to tens of thousands of dollars, because... Because then you have his marriage to Monica in the lead up to which like, there is an entire episode dedicated to Chandler and Monica arguing about whether or not Chandler should pay for Monica's dream wedding with his savings. And I think they eventually settle on like, you know, Monica's like plan B wedding, which is like slightly less extravagant, even though they have like 400 of their friends and go to one of the most exclusive places in all of New York. And a, a fan of friends with more time on their hands than us has calculated that that plan B wedding actually cost about sixty fucking thousand dollars or about seventy seven thousand dollars a day. Remember, this was Monica's like, you know, less extravagant option and Chandler paid it all out of pocket, but was still willing to pay for the full ginormous huge wedding completely out of pocket, which he said would have quite basically depleted all of his savings. It does make Monica sound like a horrible person though. She wanted to get rid of his entire savings he'd set aside for their family. Yeah, their for future. a single, I mean, party as he put yeah, it. Yeah, that's the thing. I think Chandler is completely justified in feeling annoyed about that because think about it. Like he's been saving up for literally decades at that point, like working a job he fucking hates to save up money for presumably before that for his future, for his retirement, and then obviously when in Monica for their future. And she looks at it, takes one, doesn't even consider why he'd have that money, and immediately says, "Let's spend it all on me." Like, that's like, you're so, oh, it's so bad. And then when he says, like, no, I'm not letting you do that, she gets annoyed about the fact she can't spend his entire life savings on a party. It's like, fucking hell. And then he says, okay, we'll go for wedding scenario, whatever the fuck it'd be. It's like, which cost him $60,000. And she still complains about it every day. It's like, woman, I'm paying $60,000 fucking thousand dollars 
for one day to get all your family out here because he doesn't even want to invite his family, it's all her friends and family. I'm going to pay for all this shit so you can wear a, like, you should go to like a Vera Wang fucking dress or whatever the fuck it is. Thousands of dollars, like all this food and shit. And then she complains in the entire time for not only to spend another hundred grand. When he says to her, like, what do you want to, what do you want to spend the money on? A house? A future? <laughs> like, no, a life for us both? Oh, wow, that's stupid. Why don't we spend it on a party? It's like, oh. It's like so bad. She just sounds so inconsiderate. It's horrendous. Let's just appreciate for a second how nice Chandler actually is. Like, yeah. Because at the end of the episode, he turns around and says, if that's what you want, yeah. we'll do it. I will completely drain the entirety of my life savings so you can have one day where you feel special. And he's, he's fine with it. And not to mention, like, all this money he's already lent to Joey. Like, he probably he could have probably paid for the wedding if he asked for the money back from Joey. Think about that, man. Holy shit. Like, I think there's an episode where Joey gets a hernia... And he's like lying on the floor his insurance, his health insurance lapses. And Chandler comes in and goes, I'll pay for you to go to the hospital. Don't worry about it. And think about like, I don't know a lot about America or the healthcare system specifically, but what I do know is that that shit's not cheap. Because the only stories we really tend to get over here about the American healthcare system are ones like, oh yeah, woman has baby, is now a million pounds in debt. That kind of thing. And Chandler's like, oh no, no, I'll pay for your hernia operation out of pocket when you have no insurance in the middle of New fucking York and don't worry about paying me back. Think about that. All the, like, there's all the little moments where, like, I'm wondering how many, like, how many times they go out for pizza and Chandler must have just paid for it. Just like whip $10 out of his wallet. Especially like, if Joey's there, he's got to buy two pizzas. Every time, yeah. And obviously they're in their apartment all the time. Like he pays for the TV, the cable, all the bills. Like he, buy, he goes one, he buys all new furniture. I was going to say, there's an episode where he refurnishes the entire apartment out of guilt. Yeah, but he does it and he puts it all on his credit card. And he buys like a 50 inch plasma screen fucking TV back in like the 90s. With a button that the thing opens on its own. Yeah, think like, about how much that would have cost. Like duck and chicken food for all those years. And it do, that doesn't bankrupt him. You never see him in trouble in later episodes. The only time he ever is is when he's living with Monica and like he quits his job. Yeah. And we never really tell you how long they've quit their job for. But I'm, I'm, the only reason I'm assuming that is obviously because he quits a really high paying job evidently. And there was like, dip, and he doesn't want to nip into his savings, which is apparently for his house. So that's the only time you ever see him like really struggling for money is when he quits his job and he's basically like, they're living on one income. Mm. But they're living on one income and they were used to living on Chandler money. So if people worked out the amount from the wedding, has anybody worked out how much Joey actually does owe Chandler? Yes, another fan, like obviously Big Dick Hero right there, has like calculated roughly how much Joey owes Chandler based on the list they go through during that episode we mentioned previously. And the amount they come to was about $100,000, which is fairly steep and is quite a substantial amount for like, you know, a guy to be like, oh no, that's fine. So I'll be honest, if someone owed me a hundred grand, I'd be getting all fucking godfather on their ass. <laughs> like they, would, they would have me outside their house with a baseball bat and a horse's head, just swinging rocks at their window every day until I got that shit back. But Chandler doesn't mind. And people are wondering, well, where does that money come from? Obviously, some of it comes from like Joey's acting lessons, like food, bills, that sort of thing. But the majority comes from rent, because there is a joke in like one of the episodes about the apartment Monica lives in, it's rent controlled. And the law behind that is that Monica's grandmother lived in the apartment since like the 1930s and she was on rent control, which basically locked the rent in place. And people have worked out that could be as low as like $100 a month, depending on like how far back it goes. However, Joey and Chandler's apartment in the first season, that is not rent controlled. And the New York Post is calculated based on the rough area that it is and the, and the square footage they can estimate that that apartment would cost roughly $3,000 per month each. Ooh. So $6,000 a month, which Chandler says he pays for about three years, in, then bills, then food, then acting lessons, then headshots, all that other bullshit. I think we even have in one episode, the bills themselves aren't cheap because I think doesn't Chandler hand Joey the bills? He takes one look at how much it costs to run the apartment and he immediately starts turning off all the lights because that's how much it fucking costs. And he paid that out of pocket without even thinking about it while simultaneously like, doing all the other bullshit they do, like paying for like $4 cups of coffee and like, drinking like 40 of them a week and then probably presumably paying for all of Joey's as well. And then also think about how many times he just like walks out of work without doing shit. Like he doesn't even care about his job, does he? He just sit, he leaves his job like halfway through the day to just go to the coffee shop for two hours and goes back. And he's still like, oh man, like, how high up in his company is that guy before he quits? He, does, he actually gets promoted a few times, doesn't yeah, he? He, he, yeah. he gets sent to Tulsa yeah. to run their entire like Tulsa wing. And he doesn't get the, um, what is it now? He doesn't get a raise, does he? But he does get a Ford Focus or something. <laughs> But then the thing as well, he's flying backwards and forwards between like New York and Tulsa every fucking week. 
I'm assuming his company pays for that. Yeah, but yeah. If his company can afford to do that every single week to keep him on, how much is he being paid like, as a salary? If that's like you know worth paying him to keep him on board, it's, like, it's ridiculous. But like a hundred thousand dollars, like th- even if you just go back to like the rent. So I think the New York Post worked out, yeah, this apartment conceivably in like nineties money would be like three thousand dollars a month, like for Joey and Chandler, and Chandler's paying it all, like. Six fucking thousand dollars, and the calculation there is like for Chandler to even be able to afford, like you know, to pay all this and then save up as much as he presumably has for the wedding, he must be earning about ten thousand dollars a month after tax in nineties money. Oh, like, Mr. That, that, Bing. Well, that's the thing as well because the 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 theory is then that like, Chandler might actually very well be a fucking millionaire, which is why Phoebe looks at his saving and goes, "Well, well, well, then." <laughs> Uh, it's so ridiculous. Like, he might be a fucking multi-millionaire and it's never mentioned in any episode. Because if you think about it as well, go back to like Chandler's youth. Like, like isn't his mum like a famous author? And his dad like runs like the burlesque show in Vegas. And then you go see flashbacks to his childhood. And he's got like a pool boy and a maid yeah, and cause, shit. Because they sleep with a pool boy, don't they? Yeah, but that's what they both sleep with a pool boy. He's got a pool boy and a maid and a really like a fancy opulent as shit house. And he lives there. So presumably he must be getting shit on. He must be looking for a pretty sizable inheritance when his parents pass away. Oh man, that guy's balling. Chandler's fucking minty. That's why they can't do like a friends reunion because Chandler would just be coming in as Mr. Moneybags. Well, yes, you do have to keep in mind that these figures are the best guesses of people based on various figures throughout the show that aren't fully explained. I do think it's quite hilarious that throughout the initial run of the show in the first few seasons, Chandler being his show has been perpetually unable to get laid when presumably all he would have had to do is put a copy of his bank statement in his wallet when he went out. So we had a rant about a year ago or so about okay. how Ross is the worst friend. Oh, yeah, he is. He's, Ross is the fucking worst. I hate him. But then we've just talked about how Chandler's a good friend. Who do you think is the best friend? I mean, it's got to be Chandler. Like, just in terms of the amount of stuff he does for other people, like, he bails Joey out time and time again. Like Even the most conservative estimates of how much Joey owes Chandler says that Chandler gave like Joey tens of thousands of dollars and then never asked for it back. Like, he offers to pay for like, you know, his, his wife's like, a dream wedding out of pocket, like deplete his entire life saving just to make her happy. I think the only friend who comes close is maybe Joey himself in later seasons when he starts earning money from acting. And he again like starts being really like, you know, helpful. Like, I think he offers to like pay their Chandler and Monica's rent for like a couple of months, like write three like three thousand dollars out of pocket for like, fuck you, nothing. It's fine. I'm a big dick actor, why not? So he even makes that joke and he's like, whoa, what do you think I am? Like a television soap star. It's like, yeah, you're damn right I am. Let's get the checkbook out. But no, all the other friends are horrendous people. Well, the difference with Joey there, though, is that Joey is a really nice friend, but a terrible human being. No, it's, I think Joey's really nice. Have you not seen the way, no, the way he treats women is terrible. Yeah, but the thing is, though, does he ever, uh, in any episode, portray himself as anything other than, like, you know, that kind of guy? He is never anything but honest with all the women he meets. I guess, yeah, because oh, like Barney Stinson is a, a comparison to another show. Yeah. Barney Stinson is an asshole the way he deals with women. Yeah, because but he obviously... Jo- Joey is honest. Yeah, Joey's honest he's... in his intentions. Like, I'm going, I want to sleep with that woman. I will approach her in the mouth. I want to sleep with her. Like, he's, never, he's never underhanded about his intentions, like, say, like, Ross is in some episodes. Like, you know, being the nice guy trying to sneak under the radar. He does, however, tell Rachel that um, Chandler always used to make pancakes... For the girls he sleeps with, and tell them, <laughs> tell them that he wasn't interested and send them on their way. Yeah, that's kind of a bad. So, I mean, that episode shown as a growing point for Joey, where he decides he wants to spend more time with a woman, and she yeah. turns him down. But then that does mean that the entire time Chandler was there, not only was he paying all his bills, yeah. he was oh. also kicking out his Which women. Which means he's an even better friend than he was, because not only that, he was wingmanning for him in the morning. He was being a wingman and a sugar daddy at the same time. He was being a wing sugar daddy. A sugar wingman. What's the? We're we'll going to create something here. There's a portmanteau of words. He was a wingman and a sugar daddy. Sugar wings. Sugar wings. Wing sugar. Wing daddy. He wing was daddy. a wing daddy. Wing daddy. Chandler was Joey's wing daddy. There it is. There's the title for this episode. <laughs> to give you a clue, what the fuck is a wing daddy? The Chandler the wing daddy. <laughs> it's so good. You need to pull that behind me. It's a picture of Chandler. And it's underneath it. Wing daddy. <laughs> so good. Well, like, yeah, that makes him out to be an even better friend than us. Because like, not only was he like a good friend, he was a proper bro. He was, like, looking out for his mate's penis the entire fucking time while also never getting laid himself. Well, Joey, as well, is always trying to help out his friends because he does get Phoebe that job as the extra. Yeah, when she's, like, you know, starting to run low on money. And, and she then fucks it, it up for him. Yeah, she he has to get her fired because she, like, starts to... No, I'm bigger, I'm bigger than this job is. I'm bigger than you. I'm blocking your shine. Even brings Rachel on set to watch the shows. Yeah, like, because, you know, she's a huge fan. And then, obviously... But I think, like, Joey in early season is a bit of an asshole, but, yeah, he probably has, like, the best arc. 
because as the season's gone, he becomes like a really nice, genuine guy. And he grows and he looks back at what he was as like a younger man and goes, oh, I was a bit of an arsehole. Like, I did treat women a bit poorly and he learns from it. And I hope in the show, Joey, when he gets star and roll on Deep Powder, that he goes back and pays Chandler some of that money. I hope he does, yeah. That's, that's <laughs> your head cannon for that. But no, Joey and Chandler are the, like, the most genuine friends. So I think earlier in the seasons, yeah. But I think that's more to do with how the character was written. Because originally, the character of Joey was written to be like, you know, a just a generic smug asshole. And it was um, Matt LeBlanc who put the, um, the spin on it. He was like, he's di a bit dim. Yeah. And he put that spin on the character, which obviously he was allowed to explore in later seasons. So if you look at him in early seasons, he's all like posing and brooding. And it's as it goes on, it like, just becomes more and more Joey-like. When I was younger, I wanted season one Joey's hair. <laughs> season one Joey's hair is amazing. I wanted season one everyone's hair, man. <laughs> Everyone on that show went through like, they went through the hair limpics. So obviously there's a famous, there was the Rachel, which apparently uh, her barber was stoned when he did it and just like hacked away at her hair and just left it all choppy and messy. And he was a fucking ball ache to do. Then you had like early season Chandler when he had like, you know, the, uh, the guy you'd see in the library reading a book. Like that kind of haircut. Then obviously you had like just Ross who just never grew. Yeah, Ross's hair was identical all the way he through. He just stayed, he's had like fucking the rock solid action man hair that never fucking moved. You know what, that's a good way to end this because we've done a video for where I shit on Ross as a character. So let's, you know what, let's go back and say like my favourite Ross moment. And that's the one where the guy at his office steals his fucking sandwich. Because that to me is one of the most infuriating episodes to watch back as an adult. Because as a kid, it's, you know, it's funny looking at the man getting angry, but as you get older, I realise, like, Ross is 100% right in that situation. He had a sandwich in his work fridge that was his, with his name on it, and his boss comes in and eats it. And Ross's reaction is quite... Like, and Ross's reaction is completely justified. Why the fuck did you steal my sandwich? I'm having a really rough time. I was looking forward to that shit all day. You took it, and the guy says, oh, I just took it out of the fridge. That was my house now. And he pretends it's not a big deal. It's, no, it's a big fucking deal. You took, you stole someone else's fucking property. Then his boss offers him a bin sandwich. Yeah, he says like, oh yeah, I threw it away. So you didn't even eat it. There you might took... be something left in the trash. I'll get it for you. So, so he's that dickhead at the office who just steals people's food and then says it's not a big deal. But isn't he also like Ross's boss? I think so, yeah. Yeah, and then he gets him like put on hiatus because he's angry with him for him stealing his shit. Yeah, I think Ross gets put on sabbatical and then they they kick him out. I don't, don't think he, no, he comes back for one day and then gets kicked out again for getting angry. But it's the thing of like, you stole his sandwich, he acts in a completely justified manner of, why the fuck did you do that? Explain yourself. And his boss goes, uh, 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 you're fired. What, I hate that guy. Like, that episode was so infuriating to watch. But I'm like, I am, well, for the first time this entire season, this entire show, I'm on your side, Ross. Because that's a fuck, that I've had that happen to me at work before. Yeah. When I used to work, you know, like fucking, and people steal your fucking food. It's so annoying. Especially when you see them eating it. And you confront them and they go, oh, well, it didn't have your name on it. And he goes, did it have your name on it though? Oh no. <clears throat> oh, and then if you obviously, it's the same thing you get with Ross. It's like, I so I would get so angry, but then I'd be the bad guy because I'm overreacting. Because it's just food. It's like, but it's my food. Like, it seems to talk about money. It's the equivalent of say, like you borrow someone like one pound fifty. It's oh man, I want to get like a bag of crisps and a sandwich. Like right, here's one pound fifty, and they give you a quid back. And you go, oh, can I get that other fifty p? Then you seem like the asshole for asking for such a small amount of money back, but but it's my fucking money. And then obviously the more you ask about it, the more of an asshole you seem. It's like when I was young, like sharing bills when you're in like student halls. Yeah. And it's like, okay, what are the bills this month? Well, it's £63.22. And I paid it. Okay, I'll give you 30 quid. Because, well, no, that's not half, is it? Well, it's only a quid, yeah, but it's my pound. And if you do that every month, for 10 months, that's a tenner. And that tenner, I can fucking use that to buy food. Also, by the way, you've stolen my bread and my milk. Oh, it's fine, I'll buy the next one. No, you won't. That's why we've got no bog roll. She said you buy the next bog roll. That's why I'm wiping my ass fucking baby wipes, you asshole. Did you have that housemate that used to go in and take one or two slices of, like, meat from a pack of meat? I had the housemate who, whenever it was their turn to buy stuff, would go to the shop and buy the four pack of bog standard smart price toilet roll that you put your finger through and take three rolls and put it in their own room and then say, oh, I paid for it this week, now it's your turn. And it's like, at that point, why am I buying like, you know, my 12 rolls of Andrex and giving them all to everybody? Fuck you. And then when you start to leave that person out, they get annoyed. Because what I'm, I'm helping, you're not. You're making things worse. You're disrupting the harmony of the house. Please fuck off forever. And I also, I'm unblocking. And as soon as I leave this house, I'm fucking taking you off Facebook because I never want to see you again. You horrendous human being. Fuck off.